Good afternoon. I'm here at uh, SOHO, at the Best of SOHO presentation, uh, and with me is uh, Dr. Mintala Haider, who uh, had a very uh, elegant uh, presentation of her abstract. It was one of the best chosen abstracts for the myelodysplastic syndromes session. Uh, welcome, Dr. Haider. Thank you. Thank you for meeting with me today. So you are asking a question in the myelodysplastic syndrome, which is not unique, but it seems like a resurgence of an idea that's been used for many years. And it's the use of uh, immunosuppressive therapy for MDS. It's somewhat forgotten, at least in the community setting. Can you tell us how this came about? Yes, uh, well at Moffitt Cancer Center, we see a large uh, amount of MDS patients. And we were interested in looking if we can contribute with this large amount of information to see if we can identify patients who would benefit with, from immune suppressive therapy. And in fact, when we looked at the database, we were able to identify 66 patients who we had treated in the past with immune suppressive therapy in the form of um, antithymocyte globulin with or without cyclosporin. And so we were interested in profiling those patients to see if we can identify selection criteria and um, help us in the management of lower risk patients with this therapy. Obviously, there's a lot of literature from Jeff Moldrim, the NIH group, and several others looking at uh, 30 to 50 percent response rates and even possibly cures in these mm -hmm. patients. And uh, what did you find in your study in terms of patient characteristics? And uh, we we confirmed a lot of the previous findings. For example, that good karyotype patients uh, seem to respond. Lower risk uh, patients seem to respond higher. We didn't really um, confirm the age in the past. Younger than 60 was a strong uh, predictive factor. We didn't find a major difference there. Uh, we had a similar hematologic improvement rate, about 42%, similar to other treatments that we can offer these patients as well. And it was relatively durable. Most patients uh, did not require another therapy until a year after receiving uh, immune suppression. And a few other points. So what is the age group or the range of your patients? The median you age was 61 years of age. Okay, so the oldest is probably in the 70s. Yes. So that's, that, that's important as well. And I guess you also looked at HLA-DR. Uh, we did. Uh, about 32 uh, patients were tested out of the 66. Um, and we did find that those who tested positive had a, a bit higher, uh, not very significant, but it trended towards favoring um, testing the HLA-DR15. Which again confirms the... Previous and obviously, the, what you gave was a rabbit or a horse ATG? Both. Both? Yes. Um, it didn't matter. It make, it make a difference. Uh, actually, our study did favor equine ATG. Okay. Mm -hmm. fair, fair enough. Yes. And you also, there was a column uh, which said cyclosporin benefit. Could yes, you, there was they, a significant benefit with adding cyclosporin, um, and usually that was for a six-month period after receiving the ATG. So take us through some of the, 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 the chart abstractions that you did. Uh, you, these patients get ATG and cyclosporin and steroids for the first month, and how long did it take for them to recover the counts on a, on a median uh, basis, two months, three months, and then after six months they go off cyclosporin? Yes, so for those who received the cyclosporin, they usually recovered within one month, if I remember correctly looking at that. Um, and of course, and I didn't look at these points specifically, but not all patients were able to complete the cyclosporin. Some needed dose adjustments, some needed breaks off for other complications with the medication. Um, that would be an interesting thing to look at in the future as well. Were there any AEs that were outstanding, that uh, adverse events that uh, were listed in the charts? Well, the majority of patients had in, uh, infusion reactions, no matter which, uh, about 80% on um, both in equine and rabbit. Um, and uh, in terms of infection and serum sickness, it was uh, below 20% for each. Uh, and it was easily managed, actually. Most patients recovered nicely. So going back to the patient selection, obviously that becomes a question. And since it's a retrospective review, uh, did the bone marrow give any evidence of a hypocellular nature or were there patients, even with hypercellular bone marrow, mm -hmm. who benefited from this? There was a trend favoring um, hypocellular bone marrow as well, um, although the majority of patients did not have a hypocellular bone marrow, actually, but it did tend to favor that. Um, uh, having less percent blast in the past was shown also to, be, uh, to have a uh, more response in those patients. I understand you have done additional tests, including the genomics in the next generation sequencing. Is that correct? Yes, we're looking at um, gene mutations, and we did 
uh, we're looking forward to presenting that at ASH this at year. Ash. We look forward to that as well. Thank so you. obviously it's a very important uh, presentation because it's not just a resurgence, but the fact that you can use this as an option. It appears that many of them just receive one treatment and, and after six months it's done and it's durable as opposed to getting some treatments and transfusions uh, for the lifelong period. That's exactly right. and. Um, Actually, one of the benefits of presenting this is it created discussion and there was a recommendation to look at a meta-analysis, including our study now. And so I think that will be very interesting for me to pursue in the future as well. Excellent. That's indeed would be a good effort. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Haider. That is a very nice presentation. Thank you very and much all for the your best. time. Thank you.